You are listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast brought to you by Birmingham Live. Hello, welcome back to the Claret and Blue podcast. My name is Dan Rhodes and I'm joined by James Rushton today. James, it looks very tropical where you are with those lights behind you. <laughs> I know, yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm actually in uh, Barbados. At the <laughs> well, thank you very much for your commitment to the podcast. Um, it's going to be a bit of a, a strangle today, a bit of a short one. Obviously, no Aston Villa football to talk about. Um, the postponement of the Burnley game on Saturday. Uh, we did a, a football manager stream on Saturday afternoon, so if anyone wants to go back and watch that shambles, <laughs> you can do so on the channel. We talked a bit about the postponement during that, but obviously that wasn't a proper podcast. So let's just quickly uh, touch on that before we move on to Emmy Martinez. Um, disappointing, wasn't it? That game has been called off and... Yeah, football is in a bit of a mess at the moment. I'm not really sure what's happening with Boxing Day as yet and, and, the, and the fixtures that come after that. I think there's meetings today with the, with the clubs in the Premier League. Um, but yeah, just a mess, isn't it? It's a shambles. I think uh, what I will say is I think Villa did everything in their protocol to to abide by it. It's just a, a shambles of a protocol. I think there needs mm. to be probably more proactive action taken by the FA and uh, Premier League, whether that's postponing matches at the site of it, dealing with it a different way. Um, there was a conversation about Chelsea as well yesterday. Um, their bench had two keepers on it, it looked like. So, you know, it, it's a bit of a... I don't know, maybe that was their personal choice, but it was, it's just an odd situation to put clubs in, especially with it being so widespread. Um, we actually had a, a poll out company-wide, like an opinion poll company-wide. For, over for nearly 5,000 people set, voted in it, so it's quite a lot of people, actually. Um, they could only vote once as well, so it's a, even more. It's not just people repeating the vote down, but... 56% of people think the season will be paused, which that would be massive at this point in time. Mm. It makes sense to me that they just put a, a break on it two games ago and said, right, till January 1st, that's when we're going to come back. Everyone have Christmas off, basically, a little extended two-week winter break. and That, that kind of makes sense. Everyone's at a level playing field then. No one's missing games behind. Um, but, yeah, we're not in charge and the people in charge don't know what they're doing. So that doesn't exactly help, does it? Um, yeah. But, yeah, like we said, no villa to talk about. It's not a proper podcast today. But Fans Football of the Year, we did a, an episode with Ash uh, two, three weeks ago now with the, with the nominees. Emmy Martinez, Esri Concer, Douglas Louise and Matty Cash were the four. Um, John McGinn, probably um, harsh to miss out there. Nakamba with his recent form, maybe as well. Ollie Watkins uh, had a good 2021. Um, but as we all know, Villa had a, a bit of a ropey year as a whole. Pretty rubbish uh, throughout really <laughs> let's be honest the end of 2021 and the, and the start of the, the new season um, and we've got a winner haven't we James do you want to reveal it so this is your this is your little baby really isn't it? this is what you work on day yeah. to day more so than anything else yeah it's amazing actually to be involved with such a, a big award um, you know uh, can you just for those that have mainly only seen the Villa vote can you just explain what the award is from a, a company wide standpoint as well yes it's um, giving fans a say in the, the big votes of the year and choosing their football of the year. I know, obviously, all the journalists and staff in our company um, across the United Kingdom and um, Ireland put in a, uh, their say for the players, but I think it's it's broadly representative of the fans. I think there was one person I picked, uh, Andy Lonergan. He didn't make the, <laughs> he didn't make the final he didn't make the final vote. I think that was personal choice, but. You know, when you see how well Jack Grealish did last year, I think it was very representative of what fans thought this year's season even more so. Um, but yeah, Villa's vote speaks for itself. I think it's a, a really good vote to be uh, a part of. Villa fans were massive in the vote as well. Yeah. I think they were like, they were in the top five of voting clubs when you could, you could see the international fan bases some of those top six have. To break that top six, I think they were above Arsenal. Incredible. So there was a, a kind of league-wide vote with the likes of Mo Salah, Declan Rice, those kind of players in there. I think it was whittled down to seven that, that clubs uh, fans could vote between. But then there was a, a club vote for each each club in the Premier League as well, four nominees per club, which is obviously what we're going to talk about, the Aston Villa one. No one cares about the national vote, do they? There's no <laughs> nah. Villa players in that, so nobody cares. Um, but the four for Villa, as I said, were Martinez, Cash, Louise and Conza. I personally vote for Martinez. I know that you voted for Conza. Um, but yeah, Martinez won. With a, a good, good percentage of the vote as well, sixty-seven percent of fans voted for Martinez. Yeah. I think it was just over four thousand Villa fans voted on a specific Villa vote. So yeah, good numbers return on that. Uh, we mentioned it in the podcast. We've done a lot of social posts. I'm sure you'd have seen seen this vote um, being mentioned in the last few weeks. Uh, I've got a few questions for you for Martinez though, because it's, it's pretty much a love letter to Emi Martinez. He's many people's favourite player. Yeah, absolutely love the love the guy. I've got four or five questions for you to run through, and this is going to be today's little. A bonus episode. We could have just said let's not do a podcast today because there's no Villa game to talk about. So let's just talk about Emmy Martinez. So first of all, question number one: Was Martinez deserved of this award, and if so, why? 
Absolutely. I think look, those questions, I think when Ash chose his Packer nominees, why wasn't Ollie Watkins in? Why did Douglas Louise make it? I think all could have been deserving, especially so, so for some of their performances at the later end of this year. Amy Martinez, though, has been a cut above. I mean, even in, in, in 2020, his second he joined the club, he's redefined what goalkeeping is at Aston Villa. I think he's a credit to the club. I think he's a credit to goalkeeping. He's a credit to Argentina. Um, his impact in the you know in the summer, which we'll speak about for his uh, national team, fantastic. He's a legend. I really hope he's at Villa for a long, long time. Yeah, I said sixty-seven uh, percent of the vote, and I did work this out myself, so it could be wrong. Martin, <laughs> I don't know whether I can actually give away the numbers, but Martin has got two thousand eight hundred eighty-six votes out of I think it was four thousand two hundred and something. I'm pretty sure that's sixty-seven yeah, percent. He's, he's blew everyone away essentially. Yeah, right? compared to the other numbers, nobody else got over a thousand. So yeah, Emma Martinez definitely led the way. Uh, Conso, who you voted for, did come second, by the way. So yeah, uh, Matty Cash wasn't far behind as well, which yeah. surprises me. Um, have you got a standout Martinez moment? during yeah. the, his kind of 15 months in, uh, at Aston Villa. He's barely slipped up at Aston Villa. There's been a few dodgy moments. I remember him flying out the box for a tackle once and uh, almost looked like he took the lad's head off. Uh, I don't know if it was this season or last season. Um, can't that was remember. this season, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, was, uh, it was a deadly one, that was. And I thought it would be, uh, be sent off. But look, those are moments are few and far between. Um, you, you, there's a lot to like about a lot of goalkeepers in the Premier League. I think the, in general, when they end up in clangers, the quality of goalkeepers pretty high when you're seeing what Dubravka can do against you know Man City despite his team losing but um, I digress the best moment for Emi Martinez wasn't in a Villa shirt it was in an Argentina shirt we can claim that because it was a Villa player at the time of course <laughs> but, um, in the penalty shootout um, against Colombia you know penalty shootouts are a lottery there is a there is technique and psychology involved but Look of the draw can win the day easily in a penalty shooter. If you're not, if you're the best penalty taker in the world, say a Mo Salah, who has a technique, and you slip up that technique and it's saved, you had your one shot and you blew it. Martinez stood up, stood tall, and used his mentality to to shake Colombia and win single handedly almost the penalty shooter. Of course, he had to rely on his teammates to score the goals, but I bet if he stepped up, he'd have <laughs> nailed one, mate. Like that, <laughs> that's exactly what he's all about. And I think, look. He's probably mates with Mary Yerry Mina, but what he did to him was almost like disgraceful. He he won that penalty shootout on his own. He he Funny won that, <laughs> that penalty. Yeah, it was hilarious. But um, you know, it, it's almost like yeah, that should be against the rules. How can you do that to someone? And he, he did it to Bruno Fernandez as well, didn't he? So yeah, he did it to Mo Salah, but Mo Salah's just too good, isn't he? Um, you know, he, he's tried to rattle people, and he has it has worked against some of the best penalty takers in the world. I think he's alone as an elite penalty disruptor and a penalty saver. Like when it's that showdown between him and someone else, chances are he's going to win it. Not necessarily by his uh, ability in goal, but his mental ability. He knows how to get to someone. And it showed you in that Liverpool match when Henderson a step b- between him and Salah, that people know it as well. They know mm. that you can't leave it's like you can't leave him in a room alone with someone. Like, come out crying. <laughs> like, and he's a nice guy as well, which is why I don't get where it comes from. But look, he's an elite goalkeeper, and that's defined by his mentality, Dan. Hmm. I was going to mention the, the Fernandez penalty as well, kind of going up to him and saying, yeah, Ronaldo should take this, Ronaldo <laughs> should take this. And then it, in the same game, I don't know whether it was after the penalty, but the, the, you know, the little dance to the, the Man United fans as well. Just, just That's what you want to see from your, your footballers, isn't it? One the opposition, playing well for, for your side, and his mentality does absolutely set him apart. You know, that does go a long way, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And the only reason I say the moment in the Argentina shirt more so than the Villa is because the stakes are so much higher. Like, mm. It's in, it's a continental, international competition. One if that I had put you on the spot for a Villa moment, is the one you can think of? Yeah, Fernandez instantly. Yeah. Um, he's done. Look, the great saves are almost boring compared to what he can do with his mouth. <laughs> <You know? laughs> when he's when he's there spitting in different languages, by the way, thrown <laughs> yeah. out at anyone who's given it to to him. It, it's great. It's great to watch. It's great to watch. A, you know, the goalkeeper position. A lot of it is obviously based on your physicality. You have to be tall and fairly like lanky to be anyway. But the mental side of it, you see goalkeepers make that one clanger. They're never the same again. 
it's like Martinez is absolutely not phased by any mistake he makes, and he's mm. more than willing to push pressure on other people on the opposition side, of course. Um, of the twenty million that we spent on him in in twenty twenty, twenty million or so, where does that transfer rank in Villa's kind of transfer history in terms of uh, uh, being a good deal, effectively? You know, twenty million is not not cheap. It's twenty million pounds. <laughs> First of all, what's he worth now, and how good of a deal is that? Oh, well, he's worth whatever Villa think is, whether that's 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 million, 100 million, whatever he goes for, there's going to be profit on there. Um, I ideally hope that doesn't happen, but that's how Villa operate. They get a player that's probably undervalued, put them at the centre of what they do and reap in the value when it comes in. They've already had plenty from Emi Martinez. What he's done on the football pitch has been almost a stuff of legend. To be honest, Aston Villa, I don't think, you know, you don't say that lightly, but what he's done. When I say transform goalkeeping at Aston Villa, absolutely true. Um, I'd rank him up there as one of the best that we've ever had, especially in the mo- the modern day. What he's up against, the people he's up against, and the league he's competing in, he's right up there. Um, transfer deal, uh, where does it rank? Right up there, mate. Don't get me wrong, but John McGinn, free, yeah, I'd admit that you know that's hard to beat. Even then, you're gonna you got your, your Ollie Watkins deal uh, back in the day. I mean, it probably didn't work out that way, but paying for Darren Bent to keep us up at the time just seemed like a really good deal at the time, even though what came down the tracks. But look, mm. Emmy Martinez, probably number two deal in the recent years, but John McGinn takes the cake for that, mate. No one, he, he can't not. Yeah, there's, there's not many footballers that will leave Aston Villa for a profit. And um, in recent years, pretty much everyone we saw we've lost money on. So it's difficult to say how, from a from a financial point of view, that they're good deals to, to give them high wages and then lose them for way less than we paid for them. Martinez, like you said, if he does go, will go for more than 20 million. Um, God forbid the day that he leaves. John McGinn also, if he leaves, it'd be more, more than 3 million value for money there. It's incredible. Um, the other one that was, like we've already mentioned, second place on the list as well, Esri Konza for 10, 11, 12 million. Again, massive profit there if he leaves one day. Um, Villa are operating in a much better manner these days, aren't they? Yeah, you know, the the chant when when I think of players leaving Aston Villa, I, I'm not as devastated as I, mm. I think they've established themselves at the club. They make a good chapter for themselves and we buy better or at least equivalent. I mean, that can't be done in every situation as you saw in the summer. It can't be. But I feel confident in the manner Aston Villa operate in the transfer market and, you know, I, you no fan likes to sit here and go talk about selling people to other clubs. But when you've got your likes of, you know, Barcelona and Real Madrid mentioned in any conversation with Martinez or Liverpool mentioned with Conza, it means big money's there to follow. And yeah. that helps take you to the next level. Martinez definitely can. Conza definitely can. The Douglas Luiz, when he keeps kicking on, definitely can. But you think about the player, the, the level you can operate on if you reinvest sensibly. Look, you can't stop players leaving, but what you can do is make the best situation for Aston Villa possible. And that's the way, you know, with the director of football, the head of recruitment they've hired, that's the way they want to operate. So you've got to deal with the cards given to you. The card mm-hmm. dealt to Aston Villa is, yes, they're still a recently promoted team, one that's looking to kick on, one with a lot of potential, one that doesn't have that. They have the backing of the owners, but they don't have the financial clout to do whatever they want in a window. Players like Martinez and Cons can either stay and help them get to that level or unlock that financial ability for them to make those deals to take them to the next level. Away from the financial side of it then, because you know, like we said, fans aren't gonna be happy about us talking about selling players. Where does he rank in terms of on the pitch? Not not for Aston Villa, because he's one of the best goalkeepers mm-hmm. we've had in my lifetime for sure. I've always, you know, if I was building a, a villa team of, of the year of, of my time going to at Villa, I'd always put Friedel in there. I like Martinez up. You got more of a connection with the players than you, than you did back in 2007, eight, nine, whenever Friedel was there. Um, so not where he ranks in terms of Villa goalkeepers, but where he, where he ranks across the Premier League. You know, on his day, he's questioning top two or three. Um, Allison and Edison set a standard apart because what they, they can do, not just as a goalkeeper, um, whereas Martinez, you think of him very much as just that goalkeeper. I know he does come out of his box, but it's a, it's a different role that Allison and Edison kind of typify more so than Martinez is more that prototype goalkeeper even though he can do these other things but you know there's a lot to like about your Pickfords you know your De Gea's your Nick Pope's uh, Lloris uh, you know Ramsdale as well Uh, I know he does a whole lot real saves when he doesn't need to but he's been all right for us but they could have had Martinez who you know on his day he's the difference between Villa losing or winning it's Mm. that simple um 
goalkeeper is really important in these top sides. But at a push, I would I would say if you say on a good day, number three goalkeeper in the league, if not number two, if not number one, the average is going to balance out that these City and Liverpool keepers are better. They're of a better standard. But Martinez, he only seems you know as he ages and gets to. I don't think he's even at his peak yet, but. As he ages and gets better, there's something about him that sets him apart. And I think, I think on a good weekend, you can be happy to call any Martinez as one of the best goalkeepers in the Premier League. On a bad weekend, yeah, you can put him beyond Jordan Pickford and Aaron Ramsey, whatever. On a good weekend, you wouldn't look stupid saying that he's right up there. Yeah, you do wonder what Martinez's stats would look like if he was in a side like Man City who faced less shots than Aston Villa and what yeah. Edison's stats would look like in a, a side that finished 11th place last season. But yeah, He's in a busy it. team. It's if buts and maybes, isn't it? And we only do absolutes here, as we said last episode. <laughs> yeah. um, final question for me. How important is he at Villa moving into 2022? Players like Tom Heaton show the same thing, that game management, that ability to get in the heads of opposition. But yeah, Emi Martinez shows it at a higher level. Um, so I think he, he's tremendously important. There's a lot of goalkeepers that can do the technical stuff that Martinez can do, but it only seems to be one Emmy Martinez. You can do the whole mental, physical thing. So, yeah, I think he's really important. That goes without saying. And if I don't think Villa lose him this year. In, you know, there's probably a day coming when they do. But I could, that's, I think, yeah, most players at Aston Villa, that, that for, for the, right now, that's probably true of them as well. But, yeah, he's right. He's he, He's tremendously important to what we're doing. Um, but if Villa are to lose him, it'll be for a good amount of money and they will have an idea of what they can do to replace him. There is def- If there's an enemy Martinez rotting on the bench at Arsenal three, four years ago, that is only going out on loan spells to Reading and Wolves, that needs that chance. There is another player out there right now in the same position. It might not be Emmy Martinez, but that situation happens. So it's Villa's, that's, but that's where Villa can play a, you know, a, an ace if they're to identify that next player right now and hopefully get them in before we do lose Emmy. So we've got that conveyor belt of talent. James, thank you very much for your time on this little brief 20 minute podcast about basically Emmy Martinez and, and the love we've got for him. And, and thanks to everyone for voting in the Fans Football of the Year awards as well. In terms of the, the next few weeks, I'm off after today. I've, I'm on my Christmas holidays. I saved up a lot of holiday days during the year to have a basically a two week break at Christmas um, because why wouldn't you do that? Yeah. Um, so no previews or anything like that, no weekly podcast, but we'll do a post match debrief after every game that goes ahead, if any do go ahead. Obviously, people will know close to the time what's happening. Um, but that should be Chelsea, Leeds and Brentford. We'll do post-match shows for those. We've also got a Christmas special, which should be coming out on Wednesday or Thursday before Christmas. Uh, so the 22nd or the 23rd. We're doing a quiz. Uh, the, the Not in the pub pub quiz returns um, with cheese and wine, um, which should be good fun. So we'll be recording that later today. We might do another Football Manager stream at some point for like the festive period, depending on people's schedules. But yeah, we'll have a little bit of a break. So thank you very much for everyone's support um, over the past year. It's been good fun. James, thanks for your time today. And uh, yeah, we'll see you again very shortly. Have a good Christmas. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please do let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode. But until then, up the villa. <laughs> <laughs>